we can actually make uh, money in an environment where everybody else is losing money. So it's basically going away from home run hitters to base hitters. That's that's how to kind of marry the two. <laughs> The next thing I want to talk to you about, and this is, I think, a, a, just a funner topic, and I think interesting, is you did a uh, episode. It was just a couple weeks ago called Moneyball Mortgage, and you interviewed a gentleman named Jim. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher his last name, but I think it was uh, Deitch or something like that. Jim Jim Deitch. So um, what's funny is is that literally like a month ago, I was heading down to uh, a visit at my corporate office and I was on the airplane and I couldn't find any. I'd watched all the new movies and I actually watched Moneyball, the actual movie with Brad Pitt, um, like literally a month ago. And then all of a sudden this topic came up, Dave Savage interviewed him and then you interviewed him on your show uh, talking about Moneyball Mortgage. And if you don't know the concept of Moneyball, the movie with Brad Pitt, which I think is a phenomenal movie, but you know, he was the general manager for the Oakland Athletics, and basically, they didn't have the, the 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 budget, if you will, that a lot of the top teams did in order to go recruit, you know, the Derek Jeters and the best players in the industry. And so they focused more on their stats of the individual players, and and maybe even some stats that other people didn't think were the most important stats, um, and and assembled their team that way, and really relied on those numbers of the individual players and their statistics to put together kind of a ragtag team that you know. Did they ever win the champ? I don't think they won the champ. I'm not going to give it away. Remember, they had some success. But they were close. Uh, they were they were close, but I don't think they actually won. But anyway, nonetheless, they put together a phenomenal team, and then then that became the strategy in which most baseball teams today use to stay under the salary caps and all that. Right? They, it's it's a focus on the numbers, and the way this translates to the mortgage industry. Maybe I'll let you unpack that. Like, how does the Moneyball movie and this conversation translate to the mortgage industry and how it is, especially guys like you and I that are running regions, you know, divisions, branches. What should we take from, from that analogy that he's drawing? The easiest analogy to marry the two, Moneyball, Mortgage, and Baseball, and Mortgage is imagine getting a bunch of Derek Jeters, like you said, or Mark McGuire's back in the day. They're home run hitters, and throughout time, the organizations, you know, sought out these home run hitters. And in Moneyball Mortgage, it was more about on-base percentage and RBIs and and how 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 many times you can actually just uh, get on base. Maybe it's a walk versus a home run. And so they sought out, and I guess for originating more smaller million dollar a month originators versus these mega producers, hundred million dollar producers that have always been the cream of the crop. Everybody wanted to be a mega producer, and this concept is more like. Maybe maybe we're more efficient, more profitable. Maybe we can win more with originators that are doing less volume, but maybe have less teams and take less pricing exceptions. And I, and I love the timing was perfect. It marries the two conversations we already had. If you're worried about your organization, imagine if everybody in the organization was in it was geared in that thought process of, am I a weight to the organization holding them down, or am I a lift to the organization lifting them up? And just getting the industry to change their mindset would be massive because it's always been about the home run hitter, the hundred million dollar producer. Well, here's a here's a little secret, guys. Most hundred million dollar producers aren't profitable. I'm not saying that that makes them a bad person. I know a lot of them. I love them. They're great people. I can rattle all their names off right now. But they typically aren't the most profitable originators for an organization because they have large teams that come with leases and and all the other stuff. And so Jim came out and said, well, let me just show you a little bit different way of, of doing mortgage. And because of what we talked about today, it's important because it's hard to make money. He's saying, hey, if we have originators that are a little bit smaller, that don't have the gigantic teams that can hold margin um, and, and can, you know, Dave Savage talked about convert, you know, converting better at a higher rate, we can actually make uh, money in an environment where everybody else is losing money. So it's basically going away from home run hitters to base hitters. That's, that's how to kind of marry the two. And Jim and Dave had their first version of that. I loved it so much. It was so perfectly timed that I had them back on and unpacked it even further. And for LOs, again, why, what does that matter to you? Like, if you like your organization, you want them to be there tomorrow, then we have to be minded like this. You have to come to the bat. You work for Tony, go, Tony, how, 
you know, one, am I, am I a weight or a lift? It starts there. Tony goes, well, let's go through it. Let's look at the stats. I'll tell you if you are. And he's not going to tell you, he's not going to try to tell you in a bad way to put you down. He might say, well, there's a few tweaks that we need to make so that you are a weight to the organ or a lift to the organization versus a weight. And so if I were an LO, I mean, I would want to know I'm a competitor. I want to make sure that I'm actually winning and providing value to the organization versus holding them down and being responsible for the loss. So um, it's a real difficult conversation to have, but it's an important conversation to have. I think the good leaders are doing it at an individual level because Tony's got a big region, you know, he's got to, he's got to do that, you know, from a hundred thousand foot level, but that is all made up of base hitters and home run hitters and staffing. And so um, as an LO, you, you really do want to care about this topic and you really want to do, uh, you really want to be a, a lift to the organization because if everybody has an opposite standpoint, that organization is going to be in a really tough spot. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully I summarized that. Okay. No, I think it did. I, I want to, you know, it's interesting as you were just talking, it made me think that I feel like as organizations, like, I don't feel like all the home run hitters, all the top producers, I don't know that it's a hundred percent their fault. Right. And Jim touched on this a little bit in, 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 in your episode, but we pay them big signing bonuses. We pay them higher comp because they're bigger producers. So we give them more comp. We give them more flexibility on their pricing because they're big producers and we want to give them better pricing. And we let them staff, you know, to the levels that they, that they staff. Right. And, and, and so all they're doing is saying, Hey, you, you gave me this environment to operate in. To me, this speaks more to how organizations are structuring, you know, their plans to incentivize that type of behavior. I mean, I just was thinking about this as you were saying it, cause I'm like, man, these poor top producers are probably feeling like, man, look, I'm out there, built, I built a hundred million dollar business and I, I lose you money. But, but Ryan's right. Most of them do cost companies money. I mean, they probably don't even know it, you know, and I don't think they do it on purpose, but part of it is the way we build incentive plans in this industry incentivizes you know, it gives incentive for those kind of producers. It promotes bad behavior. And that's very interesting and something to look at. But I think that you're right. And in, in that what I, my big takeaway from Moneyball Mortgage is that, you know, yeah, you're right. Are you drag or are you lift to an organization? And I believe that every loan officer wants to be uh, lift, right? That no one wants to be drag. And so I think as originators, you should want to understand how, those things are calculated that that's because that's, I think the big secret. And that's what me and me and Ryan nerd out on all the time. You know, we're both really into P and L's and, and, and how they work and, and comp plans and pricing models and all of those things. And loan officers tend to, in my opinion, be like, look, at the end of the day, you know, you give me the rate sheet. I ask for the PE. It's not my job to, you know, to, to know what the impact of that is. It's just my job to ask. And it's your job to say yes or no. Well, I believe that as a loan officer, you should want to learn how these economics work because, um, that way you're, you're, you are going to make sure your company stays profitable and, and, and you're contributing there. But I think if you ever want to excel in this industry and move on to other, you know, to grow in this industry, you have to learn how these, how these things work. And so, um, I think the companies take a lot of responsibility for the comp plans they put in place for the, the way that they set their margins. You know, there's things that you can do creatively to help people sell more, help your salespeople sell more mortgages, but not at the same time, you know, bankrupt your, your company. So they get to be very strategic about how it is that you're structuring those things and incentivizing the right behavior. And then I think as loan officers, you know, I don't think you realize you know, I think that if I'm a loan officer and I, every time I ask for a pricing exception, I know that I'm going to get it. I'm going to keep asking for the pricing exception because I want my friction to be as low as possible between me and my customer. So if I'm a salesperson and I'm giving a client an interest rate and I know that I can make it a little bit better, it lowers the friction in, in that, in them shopping me. Of course, I'm going to ask for that every single time. So what can we do a little bit differently to just make it a low friction process every single time and not have to have 
I mean, the E in PE is exception, <laughs> but when a exception becomes the rule, it's no longer an exception. And so, you know, I think that, I think all those things come into this. I don't blame the loan officers, but I hope that they'll go back and watch your episode with Jim, where he talks about this, because I think as a loan officer, you should want to understand it better. And, um, and, and what I would like to see organizations do is move more in the direction of offering the rate that reduce it, not just the rate, the rate and the process that reduces friction between loan officers and their borrowers and level the playing field a little bit as far as um, each of your loan officers and their contribution to your bottom line. Like that would be, I think, a goal that we could have as organizations uh, as, as we move forward and not overly reward people because they do a lot of units. Like, look, they're rewarded by the fact that they earn commission on a lot of units. Like that's their reward. We shouldn't over incent them to the place where we have to then find ways of subsidizing that uh, with other people. And they, I'd, lo I'd love to see us move in that direction. Maybe that's kind of a Pollyanna kind of an idea, but no, but I don't think it is. I mean, the fact that we're finally having this conversation means that we're at least taking steps in the right direction. When, when is the last time we had a conversation collectively about profitability, about personal impact, loan officers, personal impact, on an organization. So it starts there. We're definitely not through this. And I want to clarify, like this isn't Tony and I aren't saying like, Hey, dumb LO, are you stupid LO? We're in this position because you, we're actually taking ownership as industry leaders going, it was really on us. Like we haven't made this conversation a priority. We should have. And the last couple of years, we didn't really need to because profits were soaring and so was volume, but now we do. And it's not necessarily an LO's fault. It's as us as leaders and owners to go, Hey, we need to change our mindset, especially if the industry is not going back to what it once was. This conversation individually and collectively is going to be paramount. In what's my personal impact on this organization? Am I helping them win? Am I helping them lose? And I'm excited. I'm excited that we're having the conversation finally as an industry because I don't remember a time ever that we were. And I, I think it's going to continue because uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And out of necessity, we're going to have to continue these conversations. So I'm encouraged and LOs don't take this as a shot at you guys. We're actually taking ownership as leadership. It's really on us. Um, and like some people don't know, like Tony, I was having a conversation with $200 million producer and in their mind, they were kind of frustrated with how things were going and, you know, all the reasons why we're all frustrated. Volume's low, rates are high, blah, blah, blah. And they said, I, you know, I'm making all this money for the company. And it's like, I had to stop and go, you realize that's not true, right? In a calm manner, I wasn't trying to make them feel bad. And there was a flabbergast. What are you talking about? I did 200 million. What do you mean I didn't make money for the organization? Well, let me just show you. Shame on me for not showing you earlier, but you, you're actually negative for the year as a your personal impact. And they had no idea. So that's back to your point, Tony. They just don't know. And they don't know what they don't know because we didn't share that with them. We didn't go over these numbers individually. But I do think that's changing. Um, and if you're an LO again, ask Ask your leader, hey, what's my impact on the organization? I want to I want to make sure that I'm helping us win versus helping us lose. Yeah. And I think that I think both companies and the loan officers have a role to play here, but we have a role to play first, right? And that is A, identifying and and communicating that it's happening. And then building incentive plans and compensation plans and margin structures that um, that don't just benefit top producers that make it so that everyone has the tools they need to sell. And then once we've put those things in place, then I think educating and training the loan officers, because at the end of the day, as a loan officer, you do have to learn if you want to work for a company like an independent mortgage company where you're out you know, you're a hunter, you know, you're, you're a hunter, you're out there building your own relationships with real estate agents, with your database, right? You're bringing in the business, right? If you're a self-sourced loan officer and you want to be paid, you know, um, what a self-sourced loan officer should be paid, then you do have to recognize that there has to be enough margin in that loan to pay you that. And it's your responsibility once you have the tools and the understanding to put a sales process together, to build the kind of relationships that allow you to earn what it is you're charging your clients for the advice, the service that you're giving them. Uh, I talked about this in another episode that, you know, I don't feel like getting a mortgage is a commodity, but we can commoditize it if we don't understand that it's our advice, the education, the relationship that makes us not a commodity. And if you don't 
put those things into your formula for how to be a loan originator in today's age, then you have commoditized yourself. And there's plenty of companies that you can work at that will pay you a lot less money and give you a lot better price. And you can go sell a price off the shelf. You know what I mean? But that's not a big wheel. Yeah. And, but that's not what I don't think any of us want to do. That's not why I got in the, into this industry. And so anyway, so yeah, so Moneyball mortgage, I mean, just to, to put a bow on this at the end of the day, I think we need to look at the stats of individual loan officers. I think as we discussed, one of my favorite books is the Jocko's book, you know, extreme ownership. Ryan and I are the first to say, if this is happening, it's because we've put things in place as organizations, as an industry that need to be changed. So let's work on changing those things. Let's educate loan officers and branch managers on how they do impact the bottom line. And then let's give training and coaching and support to be able to understand what can you do to help lower the friction with your borrower and still make sure that you're bringing lift to your organization, right? I mean, that's, I think the the waterfall events that needs to happen here. And I'm committed to doing a better job at this. And I know that you are too, Ryan. And I hope that those that are listening, um, watch that episode that you did watch the interview, um, that, um, that Dave Savage did with Jim and, um, and understand this a little bit more. It'll make us better at our craft. You know, just like anything you go to work out, it starts tough. You don't see results for a while, but after a month or two, you start going, Oh, you know what? I may, I am more efficient. I, you know, I am looking at this, at a bigger level. It's like, you know, guys, LOs, you go out and make a hundred grand a year, yet you spent a hundred thousand dollars on leads. What'd you make? It's no different, right? Like, so, you know, it, you made zero dollars is the short answer. And you're, you know, that's not going to help you out. So uh, it's, it's really this, this conversation needs to be had more often. I'm glad that it's ha- being had more often. I'm going to continue to try to uh, push on it because it is, it is, is how we, you're right. It's how we preserve the industry that we love. Yeah. We don't do this and, and we can't make money as IMBs. It's left to the banks, you know, and, and this is, I love this business. I still believe in the independent mortgage bank brokers too, even. Um, but we've got to change something because we can't just sit there and lose a thousand dollars alone in perpetuity. No, no. And I, I, yeah, I totally agree. All right. Last, last topic I want to hit on Ryan last show. I want to call out is the one you just did this week. And you started off the show with, um, a a cracking sound. You're like, what, what is, what is that sound? Is that our industry breaking? And, you know, we've referenced it a few times in this conversation is, you know, well, first of all, what, what did you, I think I know what you meant by that, but what did you mean by is, is, is that the industry cracking? And, um, let's just start there. What, what, what were you thinking when you kicked off that episode and someone had to find you that like sound effect? So obviously you put some thought into, uh, the cracking, uh, analogy. That's <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the good team here at the RE Source, Eric, Eric Yokely and Ryan Christensen, but, um, and they're responsible for all the, the kudos that we get with our quality. Um, so they're, they're amazing by the way. Um, yeah, it starts with our industry, but just like anything like our, we are the biggest industry and the biggest economy in the world. So how, how we go is how everything else goes kind of, that's how I view it. Right. Like everything follows housing, instruction, and and, you know what I mean? Like the dominoes fall after that. So So we're essentially the center of the universe is what it boils down to. Our God, our (laughs) egos are healthy, aren't they? (laughs) Um, no, but like, if you look at the amount of business for trillion dollars in business and origination, yeah. it is it's the biggest industry and the biggest economy in the world. It's kind of cool to say that. And we're attached to it. It's cool. I love it. I love the business. It's very lucrative, no matter how, how hard it gets. Um, but it's broken. It's, it's broken right now. Affordability is way off the charts. It hasn't kept pace with incomes. Appreciation has gone crazy. Um, it's certainly broken. Hence why I said earlier, NAR, MBA and the builders pleaded with the Fed to stop it. Um, and now that's, you know, kind of creeping up into the bond market and, and jobs and housing. So fast forward to the the short version of that show, guys, a lot of people that are smarter than I am, and I'm starting to agree with them, are starting to believe that when we do get on the backside of this adversity, whenever that is, they're starting to say that rates have been artificially low since the Great Recession slash close to a depression ended with uh a global pandemic shutdown, two crazy events. And during that time frame, and I'm not even knocking the Fed because I don't think I could have done a better job. The world probably would have burned if I were at the helm, but they did a pretty good job 
and and basically forced rates lower, kept money moving. People had a good time. We we shouldn't have we shouldn't have done what we did the last two years, guys. You don't shut down the world and make millions of dollars. It's just not how it usually works. You fight over loaves of bread and 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 milk is what typically happens. But the Fed somehow bookend by two crazy events had an amazing run of prosperity. I mean, it was over a decade long of expansion uh, with, with the economy. That's unheard of. But the way they did it is artificially low rates. And a lot of smart people now are saying, hey, we thought that would, has, had, had become the norm. And we didn't really realize that that was really just for a season, granted a long season. And they're starting to say, hey, we think that 24, 25 in the next 10 years, may not look at all like the last 10 or 15 years because those were artificially low years for all the reasons I just said. I think they may be right. And, I, and it's not like a Armageddon scenario, but it is probably back to a five and a half, six percent rate environment for an extended period of time, um, which is it's healthier, guys. Remember, we had to keep rates low because we were unhealthy. We had two crazy events. The economy was unhealthy. So we had to spur it on with lower rates. So that was the show in a, in a nutshell. Like when we get on the backside of this, I don't believe it's going to look like the last 10 years. I think it's going to look a little bit different for our business specifically. I think appreciation goes back to a slower manageable pace, which is good. The 10 and 15 and the 20% years guys is not sustainable, which helps prevent the 20 offers without inspections and all that stuff that you hated. So appreciation goes up a little bit slower. Um, we get some refis back, not a crazy refi environment. But um, it's going to be different. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it's starting to gain steam. I don't know. Have you thought about that at all, Tony? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I totally agree with you. And I think that there is a few areas for me that I kind of hone in on specifically. We, we were at a leadership uh, meeting just last week and um, – uh, our chief investment officer was showing us a graph of interest rates, not just the last decade, the last 25 years, really, you know, rates have been improving for the last 20 plus years. Um, there's been a few years here and there, obviously where they went up, but the point is, is that there's been an abnormal, abnormally amount of refinance business available in any 12 month cycle, than you, th than ever before that. Right. I mean, I remember I got in the business, uh, 26 years ago. And there was some refinances in the business. And I, you know, my dad owned a mortgage company and he's like, we, I mean, we literally didn't even count refinances. It was like, I closed 10 loans. And he's, he's like, he goes, you closed five. I'm like, what do you mean five? I got the Jones and the Smith and the, and he's like, Oh, Oh, those refis. Oh, you know, you count those. Like it was almost a joke, you know, like you didn't even count refinances. And I'm like, well, the money all folds the same. What's, what's the issue. But, but really what it was, was a mindset thing because forever you never could expect more than 25, maybe 30% of your business to re, to be refinances. Right. Cause there's always going to be, you know, people that, you know, there's divorces, there's, you know, people need cash out people, you know, there, there's, there's, there's reasons why people would need to refinance. Um, and it's not always because rates go down. And so I agree with you that if you look at that graph and then you look at what's happened with rates now and yeah, they've, they've gone up, but the amount of loans that were in that period of time, I mean, th there's just not going to be another 20 year cycle of everyone refinancing and all of us managers telling people, well, the refinances are going to go away. And then the next year Brexit happens and then refinances are going to go away. And then COVID happens. I, I mean, uh, it was like, how many times did I keep telling our sales folks, look, th this is going to go away. And it didn't go away for two decades. Now I think that the likelihood is, is that we're going to be out of that cycle. And, and that percentage of the business probably does go away. Obviously there's going to be a refinance cycle here. When rates turn, there's no question about it. We're writing loans up close to 8% right now. So of course there's going to be a, a refinance cycle, but it's going to be nothing like the, the, the one, you know, the, the, one after another that we've seen uh, for the last 10 years for sure. And, uh, and really the, even before that. So from that perspective, I agree, there's just going to be less refinance business. That means, you know, call centers that we would see really pop up. I, I think, I think that industry changes and, and needs to focus more on purchase, which is a, kind of a scary thing because if the call centers really figure out how to do purchase, then that is going to put more pressure on, uh, those of us in the independent space, because we always assume that, hey, 
they would do refinances. And when the refinance business went away, they'd go away. Well, if they figure out how to go direct to the consumer and lower their cost of acquisition for those leads, we already know they make significantly lower comp. Um, now that becomes pressure on those of us that are out there self-sourcing. And well, the I hope reason- they get out though, Tony, like you're right. If they figure out consumer direct and purchase another adversary we have to worry about, my hope, and I think a lot of opportunistic people have gotten in the business because the margin was high. Jeff Bezos has always said, your margin's my opportunity. And because we had so much of it, that brought in a lot of competition to take bites at it. And as it shrinks, there's not going to be as many opportunistic people, which to me, I find encouraging because what I'm hoping happens is the people like you and I that are really passionate about this business inherit it. The but LOs that really love this business inherit it and not the the betters, sorry, not the opportunistic people that are there just for a season, but the people that really want to be here are going to inherit what's left. Well, here's, here's the challenge. And here's, here's what I think we are up against is I agree with you less new call centers getting in trying to, because it, it, it will be thin margins, but we, we do have better, right? I mean, are they still here? I guess they went public. I don't even know. That's a, that's the craziest story ever, but, but, you know, but, but, you know, rocket mortgage, you know, even the company I work for has, you know, a call center, a, a pretty good size call center. Who's trying to figure out, you know, and has done a pretty good job of figuring out the purchase side of the business. So, you know, and, and other larger companies that are still here today that will look at that channel. And, and here's why one of the things that we look at on the call center side of the business is that it's not so much that it's the call center versus self-source. It's the consumer behavior that tends to go online first. And when you go online, what do you find? You find rate tables. And who's behind those rate tables? Call centers. So the consumer behavior, which is going more online, if we don't figure out as independent mortgage guys, as self-sourced loan officers, we also have to find ways of getting to the consumer, not through traditional consumer direct strategies where we're gonna be paying the money and advertising on bankrate.com, but you better find out a way of getting to that client. I mean, we do it with social media. We do it with you know great communication with our databases. So there are ways that we're doing it today, but we're gonna have to do an even better job because this next generation is gonna be even more, I think, looking to go online. And what they're gonna find first is going to be these call center type business. Now they'll never have the relationship in my opinion. They'll never that, cause that's not the way they're wired. That's not the way that they're trained. It's a numbers game for them. So there are ways uh, I think of clearly differentiating yourself um, with that type of consumer, but don't be fooled that they're not going there first. And, and, and we have to watch out for that. And some of these I believe some of these call centers will do a good job of figuring out purchase because they'll be bridging the gap through technology. And you talk about it a lot. We've talked about it is that the consumer that's coming up, right? The Gen Z type consumer, they want less friction. They want things to happen quick. They want an Amazon experience. And if you can provide them that in a purchase transaction and then tie that in with some great advice and great communication, you know, it's something to be worried about. And, and so I think that that doesn't look, I, I'm not like, uh, I am a retail guy through and through, you know, I work for a company that has a call center. I love those guys, but I think that we're different. I think they think that we're different. They know, we all know that we're different, but they're evolving, trying to figure out how to deal with this market. We need to evolve as well, I guess, is my point. And, and, and recognize that the consumer behavior is different. We need the technology. We need we need to bring down the friction of the, of the loan process with them. And we need to stay high touch in doing all that somehow, right? Because that's at the end of the day where I think we bring a lot of value to it. So anyways, I, I think, and so that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is I'm concerned at what happens ultimately through that process with loan officer compensation. We've already seen middle management compensation be hit hard. I mean, some companies have just- Entire roles are gone now. Yeah, they've just eliminated entire roles. Like, oh, RVP, yeah, that whole, yeah, all no, those guys are anymore. gone. <laughs> um, 
So that's scary, right? I think that, you know, I think leadership is important in our, in our industry um, when they're focused on doing the right things. But so I, I think that there's compensation gets impacted. I'm not going to sit here and say, look, loan officers are going to make less money, but I do think that margin compression leads to LO comp compression. And I think we're already seeing that. Um, so where that leads, I don't know, but it could leave our industry a little different. I think we've talked about this before. I thought it would happen sooner where you would see the more of the emergence of larger teams, like what you've seen in the real estate industry as their um, commissions get squeezed. You see larger teams that get built up. They, 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 they uh, gain more market share. Um, so I think you see more of that in the mortgage industry, perhaps on, on the retail side. Um, but yeah, I think it all points to it, it is going to be possible that, that this looks different on, on the other side. Um, what, what are your thoughts on those things? Do you agree I mean, with I think me? to, to wrap up that, I'll give you my prediction that could be off or on, but I think the whole industry compresses. You've talked about entire levels of management being gone. Um, teams individually compress. You don't need eight LOAs, maybe need four. Um, I think the LOA and the processor role merge moving forward. I think our loan manufacturing process gets shorter, which is a good thing. Um, and so you take the best of the LOAs, the best of the processor, and you figure out that new role and you you eliminate another uh, another role. And I'm not trying to say that in a negative way, but they, they do a lot of uh, duplicate functions. Um, I think margins stay compressed out of necessity. There's a little bit fewer at bats because we have higher rates. We have a graph that we've shown many times that to Tony's point, it's almost always been a 20 to 25% uh, refi season for the last 30 plus years. I think it's going to be even lower than that, probably 20, 15 to 20% for the foreseeable future. And th none of those, those all sound bad. Those are good things. We're going to become more efficient and we're going to compress margins, be able to offer a better price because we're more efficient and the industry will move along. We'll do some refis. Uh, people will still buy homes and it'll move along at a more sustainable pace and hopefully get rid of some of these highs and lows. Uh, and the people that are left that are still really good at their craft and are a weight to their organization, they stick around. And same with the companies, they stick around. And that's what I wake up every day trying to do myself is, is be one of those that make it through this. So that's what I yeah. think it looks like in the future. Yeah. Well, I, I completely agree. The last thing that I want to say is that Oh, so the analogy that I always think about, I'm going to go back to the Fed for a second, right? When I think this is kind of good news, that the, the Fed is going to be um, very careful about not projecting or forecasting that they're going to lower rates anytime soon. Longer, you know, uh, higher for longer. Like that's their message and they're, they're going to stick with that. But every time I think about the Fed, and I, I worried about this for, for a long time, w when the Fed raises rates, I think of it like they're reloading their gun, right? So the Fed has a gun that they use to um, to fight against a bad economy, I guess is, is the best way to put it. So when we were heading in, in, a lot of people don't know this, but the Fed started raising rates in 2019. So before COVID hit and we went back to zero, they tried raising rates. And the economy wasn't ready for it yet. And it, and it started stumbling and they, and they stopped. And then COVID came and they had no bullets in their gun. They had like one bullet or two. Like they, they lowered rates like once and then they went to zero. Like they had nothing to give to fight that. So what they have to do, they had to print a whole bunch of money in order to fight the, 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 the pressures against the economy that COVID brought on. And what did that do? That brought this massive inflation situation. So the good news is right now is that the Fed is building their war chest. They are, not only did they like fill their gun, now they have like a magazine and they're over here filling their backup magazine. Meaning they're prepared to unleash that in the event that they need to. And if you look historically speaking, we can look at the dot plot and see that nothing's gonna happen until marketably until the middle of 2025. That's really when we start seeing, I mean, that's right. I mean, if I remember correctly, you see a little bit of a uh, potential Fed rate cut uh, in 20, June, yeah, June of 24, like one, but, but it's like a half point. It's like a, it's yeah. like a quarter or a half point. Yeah. It's not nothing marketed until like a year after that. I, I don't believe the dot plot. I think that it's going to be sooner than that. And I think that the fed is, 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 is loading up and they're ready to, to, to unleash. So when this does shift, I, I, don't think that it happens super quick, but I think that they will know that just like they 
fought this war over a long period of time. They didn't raise rates by five points overnight. They, they've done it. You know, they did some three-quarter point rate hikes back to back, which was unprecedented. But, you know, they're going to have the confidence that we have the tools to stimulate the economy without creating further inflation because we won't have to print money this time. Um, and so... To me, that actually gives me a good outlook. I haven't heard anyone really talk about that. But the reason why, it, it it's just, it's the analogy I've always thought of is that the Fed can't sit there with an empty gun and be effective at dealing with downturns in the economy and stabilizing the dollar when they have no ammo. They have to restock their ammo so that they can fight the fight. And they're going to create this, a downturn in our economy. I think if you watch Dan Rawich, which you should, or anybody else, it's pretty clear to me that something's going to break relatively soon as it relates to our economy. Pretty us into a recession. And then I think the Fed goes to work and hopefully they unload that first magazine pretty quick, but they got, they got a stockpile there and they have some confidence that they're, they're going to be able to fight this without causing inflation. And that's the position we want them to be in. So I kind of feel like even though the Fed's not saying it, they have to be feeling pretty good about the work they were able to do to restock, to refuel, to unload the balance sheet a bit and be ready to deal with the downturn that they inevitably are creating in our economy. Um, and as weird as that sounds, it actually gives me a little bit of confidence in, in, in where we're going. So, yep. anyways. I mean, you, I think you're right. The I don't have my charts and graphs with me that you referenced, but if you look at the four or five times this has happened previously, I'll do it with my hands since I have my chart and graphs, but it, it looks like this, the rate, the rate hike. Guys, you know what it looks like on the backside? All five times in the previous is like this. It comes straight down. And maybe it's more stair step, stair step to Tony's point, but every time previously, and Tony just articulated perfectly, they got one tool, lower rates, raise rates, lower rates, raise rates. It works, guys. As much as you hate it, it works. They're slowing the economy down and they've done it for two years straight by raising rates. It's slowing down inflation. It's working. And then they'll use the other side of that tool and it'll look like this again and rates will come back down. They probably won't come back down to the levels that we hoped, two and 3%, but they'll come back down. And that does give me hope too. Um, and that's just how every other event has played out. Yeah. So we could be wrong, but you know, the other five times previously, it's, it looked exactly like that. Right. Well, hey, and if you guys want to actually see charts and graphs, you should watch Ryan's show. I'm hoping that if we can, you know, by having Ryan on here, get some more subscribers, maybe we can get a little more sophisticated with our charts and graphs uh, and artwork that we do. No. Yeah, yeah, that works. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, like I joke. Is. I joke, but I, I do love that. And uh, we, we do show some graphs on here once in a while, Ryan, just so you know. Um, we're learning from you. We're, we're, we're getting better. But you guys with that, Ryan, I, look, we're going to have you back at some point because I love sure, these man. conversations. And, um, you know, I just think that um, it's important for these sort of things to be talked about. And I hope that those of you in our audience enjoyed this conversation. Um, I hope that you like, and subscribe to the market shares podcast. And like I share every week, it's, it's not so much that I'm trying to, to gain subscribers. I, I really don't necessarily care about that, but what I would really appreciate is telling someone else in the industry about market shares to check it out, to, to watch what's going on. If you know loan officers out there, or if you manage loan officers, encourage them to watch the RE source every Monday, encourage them to watch shows like market shares, where we talk about sales strategies and what's going on in our industry, because this is how Ryan and I got ourselves educated about this industry was by participating and caring, you know, about what's going on. And there's going to be a lot happen in our industry over the next months and, and years. And you want to be tuned into the RE source.tv. You want to watch shows like market shares and be relevant and care about what's going on in our industry. So with that, you guys, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Hills. Thank you so much for being here and we'll catch you on the next episode. Take care. Appreciate you, man. See ya.